Hello, hello, and welcome to another podcast episode of Overpowering Emotions, where I talk all things big emotions, emotion regulation. Today, I have a fantastic guest. I'm very excited to introduce her, Stephanie Elliston. She's a certified professional coach and the owner of The Steady Elevation, pairing businesses and individuals to elevate their potential. She is a self-awareness speaker and core energy coach with intentions of increasing confidence towards the desired outcomes. She's trained to remove the blocks and influences that prevent people from reaching their highest elevation. And the reason I wanted to really bring her on for our show is to be able to talk, you know, as we're on this journey of resilience, being able to talk about different stages of resilience and how we can help promote that, you know, modeling that ourselves as parents or educators or other professionals working with children and how we can help children go through these stages to really maximize their resilience. So thank you for joining me and thank you for tuning in. Well, Stephanie, thank you so much for being on the show today. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to talk about resiliency and the stages of change to help break down what a big emotional topic this could be for some individuals and parents and teachers out there. Absolutely. It is such a big topic. Well, before we jump into that, why don't you introduce yourself to the listeners? Yeah. Hello, listeners. I am Stephanie Elliston. I own The Steady Elevation. I partner with individuals and businesses to create a healthy mindset. And why that might sound vague, you know, think about when you go to the bookstore and you're trying to get that self-help book. I am that person that's going to help keep you accountable and really get to the root of the issue, which typically involves some sort of change. So that's why resiliency is going to be such a really great topic to dig into. Um, My background is organizational development. So I've worked with organizations from the retail and largest shopping center of, of America to corrections. And I've worked in jails and with officers and law enforcement. And resiliency is a topic that doesn't get dated. It continues to evolve and be a big, big emotion within people. Absolutely. And so now I have my own business and I work again with other individuals, businesses, law enforcement to help navigate and pivot during change. Wow. Lots of lots of great experiences to pull from. So maybe let's start. Well, where do you want to start? Do you want to look at the stages of resilience or is there somewhere else that you think is better to, to start with? We can dive right in. We can dive okay. right into the stages of resilience because okay. this is where this is where the meat and potatoes are for for everybody here. This is where I'll pause so everybody can grab some notebooks or a pen <laughs> because the stages are are very helpful when you're navigating change. And I like to tell people think of like the stages of grief, right? So you have acceptance, like you know when you're in acceptance or you know when you're in denial and depression and bargaining. You can see that you can be like, okay, I'm rooted in this phase, but I know what's to come. And that's the same thing with resiliency is I can break it down in stages so you know what the next one looks like. So you can kind of start to get to the light at the end of the tunnel if the change that you're going through is maybe more longstanding or tumultuous. And again, resiliency can be the detours that we have to take in a road and construction or the resiliency could look like a diagnosis that you weren't expecting. Now, with your podcast specifically, as you're helping parents and teachers navigate children with their overcoming emotions, and I've heard you say this too, Caroline, is that the best way that we could help kids is also be that model, be that role model for them, show them what strong emotional intelligence looks like, self-awareness, and resiliency falls right in here. Mm-hmm. So if you're noticing yourself or your kid, you're like, I don't, we, we just don't have resiliency. We just kind of panic and, uh, you know, get paralyzed when we have to go through that change. Rest assured, it is a muscle that we can build. So we're we're going to do that here today. So I'm going to break down the steps of resiliencies. And one of the themes of my whole practice is breakdowns lead to breakthroughs. So first step of resiliency when we find out that change happens is we check in with ourselves right? We're wondering what's going on. Um, how do I respond to this? What is my reaction? And then, you know, and then we go into an asking questions phase before I do this. And, and Caroline, I apologize. I want to bring up a story here that might help relate some of these parents and teachers and listeners to these stages. Is that, do you that'd mind if I do that? Yeah, that'd be great. 
Great. I'm going to rewind before I go into the stages and share something that's just recently happened in my life um, from somebody that's very close with me. She is a cousin of mine, and I use cousin really loosely because she's like a sister. And like all of us, she had taken time off to take her five-year-old into a doctor's appointment just to make sure that they were in their height and weight uh, appropriate measurements. And she left that doctor's appointment with a diagnosis of a tumor and cancer, okay? It was a lengthy appointment. But imagine a pivot when you're wanting just to take two hours or so off of work to check in and make sure that your daughter was okay. And it turns into something uh, so monumental. You don't even know where to begin. Your life's flipped completely upside down. So this just happened in our lives two weeks ago. And so I'm watching her go through these stages of resiliency. And I want to be clear, when we go through the stages of resiliency, it's not just a one-way arrow. We're going to fluctuate all over the map again, just like you would with stages of, of grief. Okay. So when I'm talking about the resiliency stages, I'm going to break it down into her experience. Okay. So the first one is checking in. So when she got that diagnosis right away, it is, she is checking in with herself. How is this going to affect her life? What is going to happen to her daughter? How is she feeling? She's feeling stressed. She's feeling scared. She's feeling unsure. You're in a moment of just checking in when you hear this change. Again, this could happen in a little, a quick pivot or a big, massive change like this. After you're in the checking in spot stage, then you move into asking questions. Okay, what, when is the doctor's appointment? What's going to happen at that doctor's appointment? What do chemo treatments look like? What, what does my life look like? How do I go to work? All right, you're starting to ask yourself questions to getting through that change, to cre trying to create sense of what your reality might look like. And again, you're going to see these in kids. You're going to see these in adults. This is, for, this is the stages of resiliency are for everybody. It doesn't just stop at moms and dads and parents and teachers, but then we're going to start understanding the benefits. So we've checked in, we've asked questions, and now we're going to understand the benefits here. Okay. If it, this has a really good survival rate, she said, okay, it's 95 survival rate. Um, I'm feeling good about that diagnosis. And then, you know, I have off, I have PTO, so I'm okay with with the timing of this, oh, thank goodness it's happening before she really starts kindergarten and starts school. She's understanding the benefits of what this is right now. And think about that, Caroline, how hard it might be when you so have hard. this diagnosis yeah. for this child and being like, okay, I need to get to the understanding benefits. Right. So hard. And so these are the first three steps. And that's in huge. I think even just with, when I look at anything when I'm working with clients, if they come to me, you know, having panic attacks, for example, mm -hmm. that exploration of the benefits um, in that situation, and even some of the protective factors, I think can be so valuable because it's, e it's either or, and it's, we need to really start looking at the both end. Anyway, sorry to interrupt. It's exactly that. So when I met with her in the, in the early in the infancy stages of what she had found out, I had asked her the question of like, what comforts you right now? What, what, what is comforting to you? She's like, okay, well, I know the doctor, you know, again, this diagnosis has a 95% rate, you know, so not focusing on the other five, but getting her in that space to kind of help her move into understanding the benefits. Okay. Cause the closer we get to the end game, um, she'll feel that confident, energized space. Before we get there, after understanding the benefits, we're going to start to build trust. All right. So surgery happened. It was, they captured a whole, the whole tumor, nothing ruptured, I'm building trust that this is moving forward. This is a season that will pass. All right. We're getting into routine. We're building trust of what's happening so that you can move on to the, one of the uh, final stages, which is external motivation. And that means you can see yourself being motivated, getting out into um, the exploration of what's happening, the change and making pivots and different directions that you need to go. So, all right, we need to adjust the schooling information. We need to adjust my work schedule. All right, we're going to figure out what it is that handles nausea for any sort of sickness that goes through the chemo. Go in and get all the things and supplies. You'll see yourself in that space being like, I know this is happening. I'm rooted in here and I'm going to go ahead and make some choices 
um, to make sure that I'm in this space and I can move to the last stage of it, which is confident and engage. That changes here. Okay, that arrow that I just explained, that's those stages are what's called the gradual forward motion. This is something designed by the American Society for Training and Development. So we're going through all of those stages. And like I said, Caroline, too, we're going to fluctuate all over the place, right? Say surgery didn't go well. She's going to go back to checking in, be like, well, what do we do now? What does radiation look like? She's going to ask herself some questions. We're going to go back to the beginning of these stages and kind of start to get all get to the arrow all over again. And the goal, again, isn't to have a nice straight one-way arrow. It's to understand life is up and down. And I'm going to go through this, uh, you know, tops and turvy, up and down, like a roller coaster. But every time we do something, every time we get through a resilient moment, we're going to finesse that arrow just a little bit more and a little bit more. And those are the stages of resiliency. And it sounds very action oriented, which is good, right? So we're not getting stuck in the grief. And I don't like sitting with grief too long because it's easy to go, fall into hopelessness and helplessness. And then there's, we're not doing anything. And so things like a diagnosis could be out of our control, but there's things that we can still do. And I think that that's a huge piece. When we look at the definition of resilience, it's about being able to cope with the stressors and trauma and adversity that comes into our life. And it's those steps. It's how we respond to the, the what next, right? How are we going to respond to that? And I love how you break it down. Thank you for sharing an example with that. It's hard to to visualize. I usually, you know, when I do present this to organizations or to parents and teachers, I do have a visual because you do want to write it down. What are these steps? So you can see them and say, okay, yeah, I am in building trust right now. I do feel some faith involved with this, this outcome. I see where the light at the end of the tunnel is. And to your point, you know, avoid sitting in that hopelessness or that victim spot. You know, that that's a, that's either something that we do by default because that's how we've always done it. Right. This is I've, I've been here before. I'm just going to go to bed and not think about it. Or is it by choice? Because we have to. Right. Like that was a really bad diagnosis. I'm going to sit here in helplessness because I just need to sit with this for a little bit and then figuring out how I can understand the benefits, how I can get motivated, how I can get to that confident, energized space. I just recognize if you're there in that hopelessness spot by default or by choice. Right. And hopefully bouncing out of that. Yeah. I think we've created a society too that keeps us stuck there pretty easily okay. too. Just with, you know, having a bottle of wine to cope with the stressors, you know, and just feeling like you don't have a choice or anything else that you can do. So once we have these stages of resilience, um, what then? Is there anything else that we need to look at in terms of how to support us to keep moving, I can see people getting stuck or giving up or. Right. We're well, helping it, kids through these phases too. Yeah, certainly. And we, we've all have seen ourselves get through our change. And again, resiliency is something that you build and, and listening to these podcasts and just even building that awareness muscle is you're doing it. You're already building that resiliency and strong, resilient people know that life isn't shiny Instagram photos and Facebook posts. Like we know that hard times are coming, all right? That is life. And actually that's the beauty of life. And so there are things that we can do to continue to build that muscle. And maybe the things that we're already doing, parents are already doing this. We've been here before, right? When you've experienced something before, it gets a little bit easier. The resiliency arrow gets a little bit more straighter, a little bit more finessed. You know, someone that's got a, the second child, the first child, they're like, no, no, I'm going to bubble wrap them. And I'm not going to, I'm going to make sure that they don't get into your, any outlets or go by any stairs. But by the second child, you're like, all right, go ahead. If I don't hear crying or screaming, maybe you're okay. Right. We've been there before. Our resiliency arrow is a little bit finessed. So thinking through on that, anything that you've been before, you know, you're going to be stronger with. Also, what's really important in resiliency, and you might have touched on this in, in your program too, is having that strong surrounding. People that like your, your, your spouse or coworkers, your neighbors, who are those strong surrounding that are going to help you get through that arrow, right? They're going to be the individuals that are going to help you build trust. You know, trying to avoid the people that are going to push you back into checking in and asking questions. 
you know, they're, they're great too. They have their benefits, those individuals, but you, for a resilient effort, we need those people that are going to help us build trust, help us build that external motivation, get us out, get us out to dinner when we've had, you know, a really tough week and a, you know, a tough time in our life, get us out into understanding that there's a new normal, a new life. So we can get to confident and engaged. Yeah. I and love the analogy. Ways. Oh, sorry. I, I was no, just going to say, I love the analogy of an extension cord when we can't quite reach our energy source, you know, who are those extension cords in our life to help us? And I often encourage people to create their like sort of board of committee members. And oh. so I know that I can go to this person to talk about uh, medical options. I can talk to this person to just go and have fun and remember that there's still a life outside of this diagnosis, right? Or I, I remember this person can help me with childcare. Like everybody in our life can really give us some sort of support at some level. Mm -hmm. So some being able to sit down and kind of map that out can be really helpful too. Sorry to interrupt you. That's beautiful and very visual of the extension cord and who we're going to plug that extension cord into when we're going through some of these harder times. And, and I'm talking about resiliency in hard times, like change can be fantastic and wonderful too. Um, but still having that strong support system is, is going to boost you through that, that to that confident, energized space just a little bit quicker. Yeah, mm -hmm. Absolutely. The other recommendations I do, and this might be lengthier and for a different show or a different time, but always practicing resiliency on a good day. Mm -hmm. You know, what does that look like? I, I, just because I'm in a, in a hard moment doesn't mean that's when I practice resiliency. Resiliency on a good day looks like what are three great things that happened to me today? You know, building that reserve for when those hard times come, you kind of got your gas tank or your, uh, your battery full because you're filling yourself with optimistic um, views and, and uh, energy. So I, I had the pleasure Again, this could be for a lengthier topic, but I had the pleasure of seeing Dr. Sexton. He is a, um, a medical professor at Duke University, specifically about resiliency, and he worked with healthcare workers. And this is pre-COVID, so things might be a little bit different, but worked with healthcare workers, and he did this experiment for two weeks. He had them write down three good things each day. So each day, these healthcare workers had to write three good things. By the first week, they could see an enhanced resiliency and enhanced effort. But by the second week, he raised resiliency efforts from 49, or excuse me, 71% to, nope, sorry, 79% to 41. I'm going backwards. He okay. raised it from 41% to 79%. That makes more sense. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh, no, it, it would backfired on him. No, it raised, excuse me. Um, and so he was able to re, um, just raise this by three things that happened to you. 30 seconds, Caroline, that we could spend each day practicing and building our resiliency muscle, even if change hasn't happened, even if ha we haven't had any sort of pivots in our life that day. Well, it's building that reserve and it's kind of like our emotional energy piggy bank, right? We need to keep putting in all of these deposits so that mm -hmm. when we need to withdraw, mm -hmm. we have that reserve and that gratitude. I mean, this is a bigger topic, just looking at, at how our brain, we do so much cognitive work, which is it drains all of our energy, our executive functioning power. The stronger part of our brain that has unlimited resources is our emotional brain. So when we're tapping into that gratitude, we are tapping into that emotional brain. So it's looking at the strengths that we have as a human species. That's the strongest part of our brain. So yeah, there's so much research supporting that gratitude practice. And I'm glad that you talked about you know, doing things proactively, we don't have to wait for tragedy to hit, we can do things proactively to support ourselves, to support our children, so that when some big event situation tragedy happens, we're better prepared. Right. So it's good that you right. mentioned that. Because we know we know hard times are coming. Yeah, it's yeah. just inevitable. Yeah. 
you know, and, but it takes effort. It takes time. And, you know, to back to your point too, what you were saying is our society gives us like, Hey, have some wine and have, you know, some sort of distraction. So you don't have to sit with this right now. And then you can deal with it later. Um, well, there's certainly some times that might call for that. It's also like, how do we regulate ourselves? How do we get to that balancing of that central nervous system and just having gratitude and, you know, meditation and, and yoga and just those ways that we restore ourselves again, are going to help increase that, that battery, that reserve that we need because we don't know what's, you know, coming tomorrow. Yeah, absolutely. I forgot uh, to mention that I'm from Minnesota and I'm realizing I'm saying, you know, and you betcha or anything like my Minnesota accent. And so <laughs> <laughs> I, might, I might probably just claim her that before all of my long O's start coming out. I was starting to notice, actually, I was cast in an episode because I do acting on the side, but a, a, in an episode of Fargo. So I had to practice my Minnesotan accent and it was driving my family crazy. So I, I yeah, I heard a little bit of it. it. Yeah, you can hear. Well, let me know if you need like acting practice or something. If we start talking about boats, then it really comes out. So <laughs> that's so funny. Mm -hmm. uh, any any other strategies that you think is important for us to talk about before we wrap up for today? Yeah, I think it's important to understand the resiliency looks different for everybody, and and not a one size fits all. Not one arrow is going to be the arrow that we constantly use, understanding that you fluctuate, that resiliency for some people might look like grace. Some, some people it might look for uh, just being adapting. Um, it depends on how change looks for you and being okay with that and taking the time to, to build yourself up so that you can face some of these hard times because it, it takes work, right? To reframe and flip our minds into having something more uh, positive and a, a healthier outcome, a proactive outcome is, is in the right steps to helping you get through any sort of tumultuous times. Yeah, truly. And always, I always go back to, I think about Viktor Frankl. He, if you don't know him, he was in the Holocaust and, you know, a prisoner of war and saw, you know, his whole family was killed by the Germans and everyone around him was being tortured. And so he didn't have, you know, any action plan that he could take in terms of how he was going to structure her, his day. There was so much happening to him that he had little control over. And I, I, I just like remembering it because we still have choices, even when we feel like Everything mm -hmm. is out of our control and there's nothing we can do. And we've tried everything. We still do have choices. And so for him, you know, th the thing that saved him when he was coming into the camp, the concentration camp, somebody else who was leaving to go to the gas chambers told him, if you do nothing else, I, I can't remember exactly what it was, but it was something like change your clothes every day or wash your face every day, right? Changing clothes obviously wasn't going to be happening, but washing his face, just one little thing that he could do for himself. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that gratitude practice, it, no one could control his mind and how mm -hmm. he thought about the situation and, and you know, w what he reflected on throughout his day. So we still have choices sometimes there's radical acceptance that needs to happen it's not just tolerating there's some you know big acceptance pieces here but then we can look at what is in our control mm -hmm. and so when we sit with our emotions get to that acceptance place what's that next step moving forward and i think that that's so important and when we think of these stages i love that you've really laid it out because we can keep moving forward right mm -hmm. there's that forward momentum we might come back but we can move ahead again and it's just looking at what's in my control for today for this moment even if it feels like it's too overwhelming you know for the weeks months years to come right in this moment what can i do so mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. And breaking it down into those tangible phases is is so helpful. It is because then we can get grounded in there and be like, okay, I'm here and with with discernment. And here's what, what it would look like if I got to the next step and the next step and they're baby steps into into a confident and energized space. Cause we know we know change is gonna happen, right? That's one of the constants in the world. Yeah. Change. Exactly. And we want to have that strong muscle to, to get through it. 
One quick question. Would you have, you know, for the parents and teachers and whoever else is listening, if they are working with children, would you teach children and teens these stages as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I cer it certainly is applying to anybody. You can see kids, sometimes kids are so resilient that, you know, you can see like a, a three-year-old fall down the stairs and you can see them go through the checking in, asking questions, you know, understanding the benefits, building trust, motivation, and confident and engaged within like four seconds. They're like up and at them, right? But they, they're processing each one of those stages in their head before they go in. That's why some of them think like, am I hurt? Okay. I kind of am hurt. Okay. I'm going to cry. And then until I can get to that confident engaged spot where my parents are taking care of me. Yeah. It applies to everybody. It's just how quick they want to deal with it. And, you know, I go in a background too, when I do this presentation, I talk to them about what does change look like? Does change typically look like a storm to you? Like you have to take cover. There's a lot of damage. It's scary, but you know, maybe there's a rainbow afterwards change look like a roller coaster it's up and down it's kind of exhilarating i got i got in line for this change right this change like new shoes where you're like oh look at my new shoes i got i wonder if anybody will notice this change to me right. or even like a treat or ice cream so it's it's interesting to really get aware of what has changed typically to you and that could be situational and that helps them kind of figure out, okay, this is maybe why I'm resistant to being resilient or my gradual forward motion arrow takes a little bit longer to get through because change constantly feels like a storm for me. It's scary to take cover. Yeah. That's so important. Yeah, that's that's a great point. Just looking at that change. Um, and I just want to take a step back. I love the example that you gave with, you know, a toddler falling down. One key piece is social referencing. Our kids will quickly look at us when they're not sure of how, how should I be responding in this situation? They turn to their caregivers or trusted adults. How should I be responding in this? And I, we have a huge influence in their capacity to build that resilience and to tolerate and cope. If we start freaking out, <gasps> oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. Right. It, it can be really crippling. And so being able to be supportive on the one hand, but also confident, we don't have to have all the answers, but, you know, especially in situations where, where we don't know something tragic has happened and we don't know what the outcome is, but we're confident that we're going to figure it out. We're confident that we're going to move forward. We're confident that we're going to be okay. That's, that's really important as well, especially when we are modeling this resilience for our children as well. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And that's the end of the arrow is that confident, energized space. So even as a parent watching someone fall, we're going through those stages too of this is this is some new change for me. Okay, I'm going to get to that confident, energized spot so that I can help them and, and model that behavior, right? So that's why this resiliency of the stages is going to be really important for parents and teachers because once you guys can see this and practice this model or just have the higher awareness for it, you're going to see kids do it and, it's, and see teenagers do it as well. And um, we'll, I, we, again, this could be a lengthier conversation, but it's always that first day of school, first day of school, these, you can apply this arrow in here, or usually that first week of school to where they get to that confident, engaged, changing schools. This, these, these stages are so valuable for you to see where the progress is and that monumental change for, uh, for a child. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much. This has been absolutely wonderful. I will have all of your information in the show notes, but for the people who are listening right now, where's the best place for them to find you if they want to reach out? Yeah, they can reach out to me on my website. So it's the steadyelevation.com. You can chat a message in with me there. Um, you can see the assessments that I do, um, the, the conversations that I typically have and set up a time with me and we'll chat on resiliency or empathy or all the fun emotions that need to be broken down. Wonderful. Thank you so much for being on the show. Yeah. Thanks, Caroline.